welcome, welcome everyone. It looks like um, it's look like we've got over seventy five people tuning in from all around the world. So this seems like a good um, time to start. Um, my name is Jeff Wasserstrom, and um, I'm at the University of California, Irvine, where the International Center for Writing and Translation is based, and it's the main sponsor of this event, though we're doing it in, par in partnership with um, Birkbeck College um, uh, at the University of London, where one of our speakers is from, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, uh, for which most of the panelists have written or been interviewed or both, or had excerpts of their work appear. Um, it's my great pleasure to have two esteemed uh, translators who have new books out that they'll be talking about, or in one case, a whole book series um, that includes one book, The Best China, which you just saw um, an image of, but has a series of other books um, about Hong Kong literature. That's uh, John Minford, who's coming to us um, all the way from New Zealand and quite dramatically from, um, a, hotel, from, a, a, um, uh, from a hospital um, room. When this shows commitment, commitment to translation and to talking about translation. Um, and then we also have Julia Lovell is the other one doing uh, a book launch. Um, in this case, launching her new translation of an abridged version of Monkey King, Journey to the West. I'll first invite them to uh, speak about their new projects and collect, connect their new projects to the past projects they've done. And then I'll invite comments from two um, versatile translators, um, Hu Ying, my colleague here at um, UC Irvine, who's currently chair of the East Asian Studies uh, Department, and also along with doing work in translation, writes about uh, late imperial and early Republican China, often focusing on um, female activists, uh, some of whom are also um, writers. So writing and um, activism will come together in various ways, I think, when we talk about um, this issue. Um, Brendan O'Kane uh, is the uh, other commentator. Um, he's also a versatile translator. And, and one of the things that's, that, that links um, these four very special individuals, I think, is versatility. Um, we have people who don't just write, uh, who write both historical work and do translations, and who do translations of multiple periods and multiple genres. Um, so Hu Ying has done some translation across periods and across genres. And Brendan, um, some will probably know from translations of uh, contemporary fiction, but has also done work on late imperial um, fiction. And switching back to our um, uh, to our uh, our lead speakers with John Minford, um, what I read by him before coming to this uh, coming to the Hong Kong works was his translations of Lao Tzu, which is very far removed from contemporary period. And with Julia before um, she did Monkey King. Um, one of the translations she was known for was a translation of Lu Xun's work. So without further ado, oh, one comment on procedures. Um, if you, you'll ask questions, we'll, we'll have a time for uh, audience questions. Uh, please do it through the question and answer uh, function. And then I'll bring those in after we've had time for the panelists to speak and um, ask some questions of each other. Uh, so I'd like to begin, um, John, if you would, um, tell us a bit about this um, new series that um, The Best China is part of and what inspired you, what made you want to do, take on this project? Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> you talk about commitment. Well, I think my commitment here is to Hong Kong because I've lived in Hong Kong about 15 years and I have many, many friends, writers, novelists, poets. And um, one of my dearest friends in Hong Kong was a um, poet and, and essayist called uh, Liang Bingjun or, or Liang Bingguan, often abbreviated to PK. And he and I were very, very close um, friends. And about 10 years ago, he um, organized a symposium in Hong Kong and asked me to be the guest speaker, which was simply a symposium about Hong Kong literature in translation. And out of that grew this proposal to have a new series 
of books translated well at a high level. And, and we were very lucky to get a big grant from the Hong Kong Arts Council. And over, over the subsequent 10 years, um, I've had people working on this all over the place, Canada, America, New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong. And, um, you know, it was a race against time to meet the deadline of the Arts Council because they're very strict on their deadlines, but they gave me about seven extensions, which was very kind of them. And um, we finally got the whole thing out last year and um, six books. And I suppose what, what was driving this project for me was an incredible sense of pride in Hong Kong. I mean, I, I know I'm British and I know Hong Kong was a British colony, but that's got nothing to do with it at all because all my friends in Hong Kong are Chinese and they like to laugh about the colonial past, as do I. But um, the fact of the matter is that over these years since 1949, there's been the most extraordinary um, environment in Hong Kong where creative thinking and creative writing have flourished. And the fact that it's been largely ignored in the world is a really a terrible state of affairs. And so I was absolutely committed to trying to do something to put that right. And um, so I got, I got this grant and I got various young people, students and colleagues to help. And it was a long push, 10 years to get it to the very end. And it nearly fell down several times. First of all, the publisher, the original publisher was Hong Kong University Press. And they just simply backed out and said, we're not doing it. That was after about three years, which was not very helpful. But luckily the other big press in Hong Kong, Chinese University Press immediately picked up the project and they were absolutely superb. In fact, one of my, if I, if I think about this whole issue of translation, one of my, one of my personal, um, I'd say obsessions is that publishers are so important. I have been very, very fortunate over the years to work with extremely um, cultivated and helpful people in the publishing world. It's becoming less and less common now. But in the case of this series, we were very lucky to get the Chinese University Press of Hong Kong to come on board. And their very gifted team of people just absolutely busted their guts to get this thing finished on time. Without them, I'd have never got it done. And the series tries to cover the wide spectrum of, of Chinese um, literature as written by Hong Kong people, many of whom you know, were born in the mainland and escaped to Hong Kong. Um, and it, sort of, it has a big novel called The Drunkard, which is one of the great novels of the Chinese, of Chinese 20th century literature, but nobody reads it because the mainland has always wanted to downplay Hong Kong. Hong Kong is not supposed to have its own identity. You know, and when, I remember when a group of Hong Kong, of mainland bureaucrats came to Hong Kong in the lead up to 1997 to a group of, of, of Hong Kong writers. They said, don't worry, Hong Kong culture will remain unchanged. You will have horse racing and prostitution. Don't worry, everything will be fine. Because they despised the local talent. You know, they really did deeply. And when, when people from Hong Kong would go to conferences, they were always being cold shouldered by the mainland, you know. And the mainland had a very, very um, poor attitude really towards Hong Kong. And of course, now we're seeing the final denouement of that attitude, which is to basically destroy, destroy the place once and for all. And so this series, if you like, is a kind of swan song. You know, it's, 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 it's what was still possible until a few years ago, basically, because translation takes time. And um, these works, poetry, fiction, essays, and so on, they're all a reflection of what I call the freewheeling spirit of Hong Kong. The ability to say what you think, you know, the ability to challenge your next door neighbor and say, well, okay, you think that, but I think this. Let's not either of us go to jail, you know. And if, unfortunately, that's no longer the case. There's a hotline now you can call up. I can say, oh, by the way, I know someone called Jeff Wasserstrom. He's got very bad ideas about Hong Kong. Why not arrest him tomorrow, you know? I mean, that, that's the current situation. And they'll be building labor camps on Lantau Island and everything. For me, it's been, it's been the most terrible thing this last um, four or five years, really, watching this happen. I mean, of course, it was, it was predictable, but nobody thought it would be quite as brutal and inhumane as it is. So therefore, I'm particularly proud of this series because it does really represent the soul of Hong Kong, you know. I mean, that sounds a bit pretentious, but it does. These people, I mean, if you, if you look at the best China, it's, it's got 
it's got a very powerful essay by Jimmy Lai on the, on the importance of freedom of information. And, and Jimmy's a guy who, you know, has, has single-handedly financed the democracy movement in Hong Kong, which is considered to be a crime, you know. And, um, and there's many other wonderful things, wonderful essays, which exhibit the wide range of thinking going on in this, in this territory, right from the beginning. I mean, right from the very, very beginning, right from 1840, you know, remarkable things were being thought and remarkable ideas expressed in writing. And some of them are English. There, was, there, were, even, there were about half a dozen English writers. But what they have in common is, is a very deep um, connection with Hong Kong. I mean, after all, whatever one may say about India, and of course, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to, um, you know, sing the praises of the British Empire, but I mean, India, Anglo-Indian literature is world renowned. I mean, some of the finest writers in the English language emerged out of India. And there is a superb essay in the best China by a writer called Timothy Mo, who writes in English, but he's Chinese, he's half Chinese. His father was a lawyer in Hong Kong. Timothy's a close friend of mine, and he, he very kindly agreed to contribute an essay, which is absolutely hilarious. It's all about boxing, but it's not about boxing at all. It's all about, it's all about having fun in life, you know, and his, his carefree, freewheeling attitude towards life. It reminds me of Lawrence Stern, you know, and Tristram Shandy. It's got this incredible zest, you know, and, and then you move to the poetry. I mean, the poetry of Liang Bingguan is superb. It's, it's among the best poetry written in the 20th century and uh, very, very, um, very delicate, but at the same time, very profound and posing huge challenges for the translator. I mean, it was a big task getting, getting six books done. And I'm very, I'm very happy to say that the, the press was absolutely committed from the very beginning. I was a little bit worried about the best China because it's very controversial. They never, they never batted an eyelid. They never wrote to say, John, you know, Jimmy's in jail, um, Margaret's in jail, you, we can't print these people. There are still pockets, dare I use the word, of resistance, you know. It's, it's, it is a, it is a, it's, not a, it's not a place that will go down like that, you know. There's an incredible um, pride, an incredible um, sense of, of dynamism. You know, the Cantonese people are really good but business people, but they're also very creative people. Look at the Hong Kong film industry, for example. You know, I mean, Wang Kar Wai is regarded all around the world as one of the great sort of auteur, you know, um, because the film industry is so much more international. But in literature, literature, they've been less well served by translation. So my job has been to really push the, push the translators to their absolute ult ultimate, and sometimes involving two or three different people on one book to get it up to scratch. Okay. Yeah. This is this is wonderful. And I in a, in a, in one way I would think we might say okay, so how does this relate to the Monkey King, a, a Chinese classic, but when I was listening to you I was thinking so many of the adjectives freewheeling and an alternative to what is sometimes thought of as uh, a vision of Chinese culture as as stayed. There's a whole another strand including freewheeling and and that's a strand that exists in some of the popular novels that I'll, I'll bring you in Julia now to talk about what drew you to to Monkey King which is of course a leap back in time and a leap in space but that's what the Monkey King does right so sure exactly um first of all huge thanks to Jeff and all the team at UCI for setting up this event. It's a real honor to be speaking alongside these stellar speakers and very moved to hear um, John talk just now about the environment in which, the, the, the changing environment in which the project began and into which its final volume has um, emerged, this very, very urgent moment for uh, Hong Kong's history. Um, but yeah, absolutely, I would, agree um jeff that there there is a, a a a type of subversiveness humorous subversiveness also in monkey king and and hearing john speak just now about timothy moe's um essay also struck a chord in relation to uh, that monkey king sensibility 
Um, so just a few words about the project. Um, so the book is an abridged translation of a Journey to the West, Shi uh, which, as is well known, is one of the masterworks of pre 20th century Chinese fiction. So one of its qi shu. For those of you, I'm sure there aren't very many in the audience, but for those who don't know the story, um, here's a very quick plot summary with a spoiler alert. So you might want to turn off the audio over the next few seconds if you uh, uh, want to keep it as a page turner. So the main character of the book is a magic monkey king called Sun Wukong with superpowers like he can travel 108,000 miles in one leap or he can transform him, transform himself into anything he likes. He's also unbeatable at Kung Fu, which comes in handy at many moments in the novel. But he's also mischievous and arrogant, and he gets into a huge fight with the Jade Emperor, the ruler of the Taoist heaven, quite early on in the novel. Um, Monkey King guzzles all the immortal peaches, wines and elixirs. And eventually, after this ginormous battle, the Buddha punishes Monkey by imprisoning him under a mountain for 500 years after which he's finally released um, so that he can expiate his sins by protecting a Chinese monk, Tripitaka, who's on a dangerous pilgrimage to out of China to India to collect Buddhist scriptures, which will then enlighten the Chinese population. Um, so Monkey, Tripitaka and two other demons turned pilgrims, they overcome multiple monsters, rivers and mountains across a journey which lasts 14 years and eventually they reach India, they pick up the sutras, deliver them back to China, then become immortals in the Buddha's monastery back in India. So among many things, the novel traces Monkey's journey from troublemaker to virtuous Buddhist. And I, to answer Jeff's second question, I wanted to take the project on for a few reasons. First, because the original novel is just such a cornerstone text for the literary, cultural imagination across China and East Asia, and also in the Chinese diaspora all over the world. It's full of insight into Chinese culture and society, especially into spiritual, religious beliefs about the afterlife. It's also a very appealing, often a very fun novel in that there's a lot of humour and mischief in the original, thanks largely to the hell-raising monkey and also, also his repartee with his fellow pilgrims uh, who are a power-napping pig monster um, and a glum river demon. And I saw the project as a great opportunity for me to take a deep dive into the language and structures of pre-modern vernacular fiction, which are an important influence on so many of the contemporary novelists that I've studied, uh, such as the uh, Nobel laureate Mo Yen. Also, between 2012 and 2018, I was working on a global history of Maoism and Journey to the West and the monkey character Sun Wukong were great favourites of Mao. So working intensively on the novel was a fascinating way of understanding one facet of Mao's own personality and obsessions. Yeah, I think I think there's another connection when I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about also Julia, your earlier work on Lu Xun, that these are the Monkey King and and Lu Xun are people who, if you don't if you don't know these literary texts, you miss so much of what's going on in contemporary Chinese discussions or, or literature. I mean, I've thought about with the fact that Lu Xun is not unknown, Monkey King is not unknown. But lots of people who feel themselves globally literate in um, in in the literature of the world won't necessarily be familiar with those texts and will miss so much about the present. And I thought about it how there's a disparity because in China there's so many texts. You mention you allude to a Shakespeare play, you allude to Hamlet or Juliet, uh, Romeo and Juliet, and they know what you're talking about. Um, and you don't know from the from the other side. So there is a way of trying to bring this in to discussion. And um, with John, with Hong Kong, if you don't know Hong Kong literature, this is a whole part of what has been going on in Chinese literature that you won't know. And both of them are in a funny way left out of both the official version of Chinese culture put forward by 
Confucius Institutes and by the official media in Beijing, and even by some of the counter to that. If you go to the Shen Yun show, which I haven't been to, but that the Falun Gong group puts on, there too, you get 5,000 years of Chinese culture that's kind of boiled down to a single cultural strand that leaves out these kind of freewheeling, challenging, turning the world upside down um, kind of traditions. So that's just my way of saying, actually, these things fit together even better than I thought. I just wanted an excuse to have John Minford and Julia Lovell on the same stage um, from opposite ends of the earth, jumping around Monkey King-like. Um, and I'll just mention one other thing that um, the best China, I first became aware of that term before the book came out, there's been China Heritage, an online site uh, that Jeremy Barme runs out of New Zealand, had a whole series um, called Best China, in which some of the essays that show up in the book uh, were showed up, but also others. Um, my favorite being one by Ken Leong, a um, Hong Kong writer who talked about the political valence of the idea of a frog being slowly boiled in, in water, the temperature being kicked up continually. And if you, at certain points, people realized it was now or never and needed to stand up. So I found those, those writings very, very inspiring. Um, so um, thank you both for that. I think I wanna bring in Hu Ying and Brendan so that we can go fairly soon to um, two questions from the audience, which includes translators, um, which includes somebody who just introduced themselves who's tuning in from Argentina. Uh, we have really um, uh, a very global and very um, interdisciplinary group. So I wanna to get to that. But first Hu Ying, I'd like to invite you to make comments about anything that the two have said or pose any questions to them that you want answered. Thank you. Um, right, so when I was fresh out about 30 years ago, uh, putting together three, four syllabi uh, on Chinese literature used to be a real challenge. Uh, the choices of translation were quite limited then, but because of the good work of uh, translators like the two of you, um, we're in a very different place. We get to hear so many voices out there. Um, so I speak as a great admirer and a direct beneficiary of your works, uh, which I use often in my classrooms. Um, so for those of us studying, teaching, or translating Chinese literature in Euro America, so often we feel the gulf uh, between the original and our English speaking reader. And when it's bridged in a beautiful translation, it's really nothing short of fabulous. I know it's not easy to articulate what you do uh, in a creative process and translation is for sure a creative process. So in my allotted time, I'm gonna uh, raise three questions so that we get to hear from the two of you, um, you know, how, how you make that uh, fabulous thing happen, uh, bridging that gap. My first question is for Julia. So for many years, I used your translation of Lu Xun and only recently read your translation of Monkey King. And the question has to do with the larger translation, I mean, larger uh, decision uh, of how to translate pre-modern versus modern literature. I really enjoy how you bring the ancient text up to date and toward the end of a very informative introduction, you discussed the many aspects, the many shapes the monkey assumed in the modern world, uh, from the icon of a revolutionary rebel in communist China to uh, Hong Kong martial arts films to Japanese anime to even uh, Kung Fu Panda. In the actual work of translation, though, it's not easy to build that bridge. Um, so in addition to bridging the foreign and the domestic, meaning Chinese to English, when you translate pre-modern Chinese literature, you're really dealing with uh, something doubly foreign in the sense that the foreign is a, uh, is a, the past is a foreign country and the foreign is a foreign country. <laughs> so I'd love to know when you decide to translate Monkey King, whether you feel um, 
that you need to sort of create a particular kind of English. I, I don't mean the sort of uh, archaic sounding English that uh, let's say Herbert Giles might use, but maybe, you know, um, like Arthur Whaley's um, particular sort of vernacular folksiness uh, to communicate that, that, that vernacular aspect. Or Anthony Yu's um, scholarly rendition, I think a New York Times reviewer called it uh, uncondescending literalness. So I'm curious to know, um, you know what your strategies are um, and whether they're different from your strategies when you translated Lu Xun. So my second question has to do with footnotes um, for both John and Julia. So faced with the yawning gap between the original text and the target language, I've often felt the temptation to sort of fill or bridge the gap with um, lots of footnotes. <laughs> and I feel somewhat uh, bolstered by what Nabokov said about translation. And he uses this striking metaphor. He says, um, the ideal translation has one line of the translated text and then a rising skyscraper of footnotes. <laughs> and I think what he's trying to say uh, in his hyperbolic way is to stress the foreignness of the original to basically, you know, not so much building the bridge as to uh, point, point to the very gap to say to the reader, that you know you don't get it. <laughs> that 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 you know reading that one line of text uh, isn't gonna do it. But then again, you know footnotes are really frowned on by publishers, and with good reason. Um, you know they really impede smooth reading. And both of you are successful with trade book publishers. How do you make the decision of what to put in your footnotes? And if not footnotes, I mean, there are modern alternatives, right? So you can have marginal or ancient alternatives. You can have marginalia or you can have hyperlink. So what to do with all that missing um, information that that one line of text um, cannot possibly hope to bridge. All right, the last question is for John, um, having to do with the density of words what a translator can do in terms of transmitting that density, especially when the translator has chosen the kind of works that have super density. So compared with modern Chinese, classical Chinese um, is more concise and compact. Some say it's about two times more compact. And compared to prose, poetry is still more concise. And of the series that you were just talking about, your own translation is a book of poetry. So, so there you've chosen to translate a very compact, very dense form. And there is this striking metaphor you used in an essay. You said um, translation has to do with hearing and or knowing the sound, what the Chinese call jin, a true friend. I love how you emphasize the aspect of listening in a translator. And in the early story um, of this soul friend, Jin, um, in case uh, people are not familiar with it, there's this pair of friends, a zither player and his friend who's really good at listening. Um, and they are so in tune with each other that the listener uh, understands exactly what's in the mind or the heart of the musician. And when the friend died, the musician smashed his zither and never played. So in this archetypal image of the great friendship, the medium is music and the affinity of the friendship is ineffable. And one could connect this nonverbal string to uh, what the Tao Te Ching famously said about the inadequacy of words, you know, Tao Ke Tao and so forth, right? And yet um, translators deal with words. And unlike a gene sort of friend, a translator it sort of must be uh, two-faced, 
meaning, you know, while the Jean friend responds to the musician and to the original artist, the translator, um, surely you do face the original artist, but still more, you face your reader, let's say a student who doesn't know Chinese, who cannot begin to become a Jean, uh, a soulmate to the original text. So which side would a translator turn or turn more <laughs> toward, especially a text with super density? You know, if a translator were to be perfectly faithful to the original, then he or she would have to sort of transliterate, like when we say, you know, the Tao or Zhiyin. And to transliterate is uh, essentially not to translate, right? To say, that the term is so dense that there is no equivalent, that you're just gonna have to learn it, you know, to know the term is Jin and not some English term. And an attenuated form of translating by not translating is to translate it into a third language, let's say Latin, which you occasionally use in your translation of Yi Jing or Dao De Jing. Um, so how do you lead a novice, let's say the same student who doesn't know Chinese and doesn't know Latin, um, to know uh, or to become the soulmate of the original text? And you know, surely that's, that's how uh, translators uh, would want to do, right? To share our love of the original text with um, our readers. And, and I know you succeed in it so well, because when I read your translation, let's say of Yi Jing, I don't feel locked out. I feel like you have invited me into a familiar yet fabulous world. So how does that happen? I feel, you know, it may have something to do with poetry, not um, poetry as in pretty words, but poetry that works like poetry, like creating a language. Perhaps this question circles back to your translation of P.K. Liang's collection of poetry. For once, Jin can be either ancient or modern, um, far away or uh, close at hand. Anyway, I, I want to hear uh, the two of you say more. My Thank goodness. That is, you know, those questions are so rich and so deep. I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit stunned, I have to say. Let me try and go first, Julia, because otherwise I'll forget everything. You know, I, 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 I will take the privilege of old age here. You see, you talked about footnotes, and um, and in, in a sense, the two things are obviously connected. I mean, I I set off in back in 1970 working on Hung La Meng with a great teacher, David Hawkes, and he was dead set against footnotes. He didn't want to have footnotes, so I had to do what he said because he was the boss. Later on, as time went by, I evolved my own thoughts. And, and I, I also became absolutely fascinated by the Chinese commentator, whether of poetry or fiction, indeed of philosophy, because this is such a very, very Chinese tradition that you, you realize that every, every text, whether it be the Tao Te Ching, Hung Lo Meng, Hung Liao Jai Ji, absolutely needs a commentary. And that commentary is not a footnote, it's a sharing of ideas. And I became really quite besotted with the idea of the Chinese commentator. And in my, um, in my, book, my book of translations from Liao Jai, I started to develop that and to add the commentaries at the end of the book in a very personal way, as, as like, you know, chat, quite chatty really, saying, look, you may not understand this, but really what it means is this. And that reminds me of something else, you know, very, very informal, as indeed were all the great, the great um, commentators, you know, like Julian Jai, you know, with Hong Lam Meng. And um, that begins to be a way forward. And then to take it one step further, I don't normally do poetry because I'm, 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 not, I'm not very good at poetry, but I got involved with PK because he's a very lovely man and a great close friend. He died, unfortunately, some years ago, but he and I would spend hours and hours and hours going over translations together and um, just chatting. And very often he would say to me, John, you haven't got it at all. That's not what I said, but I actually like what you've got. 
so I'm going to change the Chinese. And for me, that was the, the perfect situation for a translator, because he didn't have any sense of propriety. He, he had no idea of, no, no, no sense of owning the work, you know. My favorite example of that was, I once showed him um, a poem written by Successful Clementi, who was a governor of Hong Kong, most remarkable man who was fluent in Cantonese. And Clementi was also a kind of old British colonial chap. He wrote this poem about Hong Kong, which is just like something out of Kipling. And I showed it to PK and I said, because we'd been asked to do something for the BBC about the handover. And I said to PK, look, look at this poem by Clementi. And would you write a reply? And he wrote a reply in, in the most perfect Cantonese, sort of almost slang, really, just, just paying his respects to this man who, who slaved away at Cantonese and became a very fluent scholar in Cantonese, but also very, he was very ironic about the whole idea of the colonial view of Hong Kong. And that was another way in which, in which the, the translator and the poet were able to share to share things on, on a level that was not primarily to do with words, but with ideas. And, um, but I think, I think and then you mentioned the Latin, my use of Latin in the Yijing. Of course, lots of people have, have, have attacked me for that. I've been attacked a lot as a translator. You wouldn't believe it. I've taken some pretty heavy blows. One colleague in California described me as a purveyor of quasi-mystical bullshit. I'm quite proud of that, actually. As a friend of mine said, we need we need every bit of quasi-mystical bullshit we can get nowadays. Anyway, my I Ching, I used the Latin with a very specific purpose, which was, and I'm so glad you picked up on it, because I was trying to say to the reader, you know, 90% of Chinese readers have no idea what the I Ching means, you know. Just like 90% of people today don't know Latin, you know. I learned Latin at school, but I was using it as a way of introducing people into a kind of never-never land, you see, a land in which certain timeless ideas reverberate, and to a lesser extent with the Tao Te Ching. And in both, in both books, I was using the, the, the voice of a commentator, which is a very valid Chinese voice, to try to buttress the, 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 buttress the translation and to try and give it a helping hand. I think I'll stop there because I'm I'm slightly running out of steam, and, and you said so much. I'll give Julia a chance to answer your questions. She's probably far more rational than I am. I, I doubt that. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Hu Ying, for those wonderful questions. And I've also picked up a beautiful phrase from you that you used to describe um, Whaley's uh, style in his monkey. I think you described it as a vernacular booksiness, which I really, really love. Um, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It's very, uh, any act of translation is challenging, but when you are operating between an original and a target language as geographically and chronologically remote from each other as um, the contemporary Anglophone world is from the early modern Chinese world, the challenges are even more redoubtable. Um, added to that, I, I'd be very interested to know what John feels about this, but I feel when, you know, whenever I've, transla I've translated mainly contemporary authors for the first time, but I have done a few what you would call sort of translations of modern classics. So Lu Chun and Zhang Ailing. And when I've done what, what are sort of deemed, when I've worked on what are deemed as sort of classic authors, I have definitely felt a greater weight on my shoulders. You know, so many people have already established relationships with these authors, you know, often through earlier translations. I sort of feel all sorts of people looking over my shoulder and, 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 and querying my choices. I think with this you know, particular um, uh, project, um, Monkey King, one way that I, or Journey to the West, one way in which I try to sort of still my 
anxieties which otherwise might have got you know out of control and I would just never have started um, doing this you know really quite challenging work of abridgment and then translation but one of the ways in which I sort of tried to calm myself down was to remind myself that this set of stories and situations and characters is one that has kind of achieved its cultural potency through reinvention, through retelling, through adaptations. So the 1592 100 chapter version, which I translated from, was itself a kind of textual version of um, earlier versions of the stories, which were very current in, for example, oral storytelling tradition, but you know, all sorts of other kind of texts and dramas uh, throughout, uh, throughout China. And almost as soon as the, that, that novel was published in the late 16th century, these situations and characters kind of um, fell back into the kind of cycle of cultural transmigration out of which they had come. So very soon later authors were writing sequels and when you come to the 20th century, um, the stories around Sun Wukong and the pilgrimage have been retold multiply um, in all sorts of media, just sort of fine arts, um, drama, music, uh, dance, uh, text and of course, film and animation. Um, so I, I, I try to tell myself that this version I'm, I'm attempting now, it's, it's just the latest adaptation. There'll be, there'll be another one soon enough. Um, and I'd also just like to pay massive tribute to the um, previous translators who worked on it. You know, they're extraordinary resources to have the, the, the Whaley, um, the, the Anthony Yu uh, version, uh, the Bill Jenner version, you know, absolutely wonderful to have these um, examples to refer to. Um, I suppose also I was though just uh, above all powered by my delight in the original story, my awareness of what, uh, how important it was for the Chinese and the East Asian cultural imagination. Um, and I, my aim was to try to create a version which both in its, in its, in its sort of choice of language and its choice of episodes that it translated, um, to create a version that both acknowledged and presented the profound difference of the story and the language, but somehow found an idiom that could speak and express the appeal of the original directly to a contemporary Anglophone readership. Uh, I don't know if I achieved that, but you know, one example of a technique that I used was to sometimes mix registers. Um, so there's the, 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 the novel is full of a very delightful satire about Chinese attitudes to uh, bureaucracy and particularly seeing heaven and hell uh, as recreating very precisely the bureaucracies and the sort of the government of the mortal world. So I had quite a lot of fun experimenting with combining quite a sort of pompous um, formal officialese with um, a sort of more colloquial um, monkeyish language if you like. And I was also, you know, while I was thinking about the translation and also writing my introduction, I really enjoyed reading um, works of criticism on the um, great fluorescence of vernacular fiction round about the time, you know, the late Ming, the time that uh, Journey to the West was written. And I was very struck by one commentary from the 16th century talking specifically about the power of this kind of vernacular storytelling, how it kind of sucks you, sucks you in. It's sort of incredibly entrancing. I sort of reminded myself that, you know, this in the original, it, it was written in a vernacular. It wasn't written in highly sort of compressed, elusive classical Chinese. You know, it had a directness to readers at the time. Um, so it from, from that perspective, it seemed logical and reasonable to, you know, try to find a, 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 a literary idiom that would convey with directness the, the freshness and the fun of the original to contemporary Anglophone readers. I think I'll move on to, to Brendan. I just want to interject two, two small things. One is that 
Julia's reference to the remaking, the playing with the original text, all kinds of versions of existing sequels, spinoffs. Maybe that's one hint of something about that's a core text in a culture. It's so well known that people revisit it in all different forms. There have also been story of the stone, dream of the red chamber. They take characters from it and project it into the future, which again says that this is something we, and AQ, the most famous anti-hero uh, in Lu Shun, the revolve, what would he say if he were alive now? What if, you know, spinoffs and, and that might be a sense that if, if something is so core to a culture that there are spinoffs, parodies, uh, play with it, that it's something we would know about. And with, with John, I just can't help but saying with the I Jing and reminding readers that most people in China, much of it will be gibberish. I thought of that when a translation of Finnegan's Wake was very popular in China. And that one of the things you would need to convey in that translation, if you made it seem completely understandable in Chinese, then of course there would be a problem. Um, you would have mistranslated it, which also yeah. one more digression reminds me that there is a Chinese translation of uh, Foucault's work called Understanding Foucault. And a, a friend of mine said he thought he would read that in Chinese to see if it made more sense than it did in English or French. But anyway, um, Brendan uh, O'Kane, if you would uh, bring in comments and again, questions uh, a la Hu Ying, that would be great. Yes, um, I, I did take a look at that translation of Finnegan's Wake and uh, it is so easy to read that it's completely unfaithful. Uh, you know, somebody like Xu Bing might have been a, you know, inventing new characters might have been a better choice. Um, so thank you to, to uh, John and to Julia. Um, like Hu Ying, I'm a, a direct beneficiary of your work as a reader, as a student, and more recently as a teacher. Um, something that strikes me about both of you is that you've worked on such a range of authors and such a range of texts. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to use your, uh, your work in a classroom because often uh, one gets to an anthology of Chinese literature and translation. It's done by somebody who knows the texts cold and yet in English they're Li Bo sounds like they're Chu Yuan. Uh, you know, things tend to blur together. Whereas both of you have always done uh, just a, a job that I really admire of rendering your authors as distinguishable and very distinct voices. Um, and so I was wondering, in the vein of a, a more general question about translation process, what is your process for deciding how? Songling sounds in English, or how Lu Shun should sound, or how Bu Chengen should sound. Uh, is it something that occurs to you as you read the original? Is it something that happens in translation or in editing? Uh, have you ever tried something and found that it just didn't work and you needed to redo it? Done after you. Um, well, okay. Um, Hu Songling um, is not really on the agenda today, but. Um, I think it's Julia's on the or phone. anybody else. Well, Pu Sung Ling, I will. I, I think I think I can say a little bit about that because Pu Sung Ling took me years to crack. I mean, I, I was always hearing about Pu Sung Ling. What a wonderful writer he was! <coughs> and um, I must have spent about seven years reading Pu Sung Ling and um, rereading it, and finally I felt I'd. I got a little key to what was really making Pu Sung Ling tick, which was his sense of humor. And of course, it was not something that was highlighted by the contemporary critics, because they want to make him out to be a you know, social realist, which is complete nonsense. <clears throat> he was a man of in infinite humor and jest. And um, the minute I realized that, the whole thing opened up. And I'm actually working on a second volume right now, because I felt, I just felt I got to know him. I mean, it's hard to get to know people across the ages, but I did feel in the end that having, having, having opened this one door, it kind of led to every other, every other door opening afterwards. And um, he was a man who had an absolutely vicious sense of humor. I mean, he could, he could be very, very vicious. He could also be very gentle, 
but his sense of humor was um, paramount. And it was a way, of, a way of writing that was supreme, I think. And you see, that was, if I can make a bridge between that and the Hong Kong thing, something that the Hong Kong writers of the past 40 years have preserved is this incredible sense of humor. Um, if I can hold, there's one of the books, if I can hold it up, I don't know if it, it's called, yeah, there's this book called The Teddy Bear Chronicles. <coughs> and it's by, <coughs> it's by a woman writer called C.C. or Sai Sai. And it's, it's the most delightful book. It has, it, it, you know, it, it, it's a, it's, she, she had to learn to make teddy bears after a very serious um, bout of breast cancer. And she made these teddy bears of famous people from Chinese culture. And then she wrote little essays to go with them. And I just happened to pick it up in a bookshop in Hong Kong and thought, wow, what a great little book, you know. Nobody else had even mentioned it. You know, it wasn't a kind of, it wasn't serious literature, you see. It had no ultimate goal. She just did it for fun. And I was very fortunate to be able to have a young PhD student who immediately latched onto the idea and spent several years translating this book. And um, when we sent it to CC, she was so delighted. She sent me a T-shirt with teddy bears. And I'll try and show you the T-shirt. She, she, she was so excited. She had all these T-shirts printed with teddy bears on them how, to say how excited she was that someone had bothered to take this work seriously. Because of course, in the mainland, it would have been dismissed as completely frivolous because it was lighthearted. It was humorous. It was warm. It was, it, was a, it was a song, you know, in praise of Chinese culture, but not, not the heavy, heavy stuff. You know, it was like delightful teddy bear. A teddy, for example, the teddy bear of Cao Sui Qin, the author of Hong Lama, was simply delightful. And Zhuangzi, you know, all, all my favorite people are in there, except they're teddy bears, you see. And I was delighted to be able to include this as a kind of um, a piece of what I call Chinese modern BG, BG Wenxue, you know, this idea of, of trivial literature, which is actually terribly important. I mean, in fact, don't use the word important. It's just terribly good. And the other book also, I'm just going to hold this one up. This is, this is um, another one which came in the same. So this is a book called um, uh, Huo Ping Chang Ru, we, we called it Ordinary Days. It's a memoir written by Leo Li, who was quite well known in America, and his wife, his wife Esther. It's based on, it's, it's inspired by the idea of of Fu Sheng Liu Ji, you know, six chapters of a floating life. And it's a very straightforward, very moving account of their, they fell in love very late in life. And then they had all sorts of problems and she suffered from severe depression, tried to commit suicide four times. But it's written with this incredible um, simplicity and um, humanity, which I absolutely fell for when I read it. And um, I, again, I had two young students helping and we, we worked with Leo and Esther to get this book out because we felt it was a very important exception, you see, a, a book about in which people don't have to be um, pretentious or, or um, they're just saying it like it is, you know, opening their hearts, basically. And again, a book like that would never, would never have even got past the publishers in, in, in the mainland. You know, I mean, the kind of thing that um, Qian Zhongshu and uh, Yang Jiang wrote was completely different, you know, mm -hmm. much more sort of um, literary and serious. Whereas this was really basically saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, until chapter four, when it says, you know, unfortunately, we're having a hard time, aren't we now? Having a hard time, having a hard time, but I still love you, you know. And that's really, you know, that doesn't kind of rate on the kind of modern classic sort of scale, you know, it's too simple. But I absolutely... I absolutely fell for it. And there again, to go back to a question of Hu Ying's, I decided um, quite late on, because I edited the translation of two students of mine, very talented young ladies, Chinese. And um, I decided that, that the Western reader would not be aware of the whole background of BG Wenxue. This is, this is a piece of BG. They wouldn't be aware of Fu Sheng Liu Ji. They wouldn't be aware of all that wonderful world. So I started adding bits of commentary of my own based on those other works. And I sent it to Leo, who's a very good friend of mine. I said, Leo, what do you think about this? And he said, John, that's absolutely perfect. You do whatever the hell you like, you know. So again, we had a we're, we're real Zhi Yin kind of relationship. And at one point I added, I added a commentary 
from a, a, an anonymous memoir. And I wrote the memoir myself, actually. So it was a complete fake. I, but I, I wanted to put it in to show what this kind of literature was about. It's what you'd call the literature of sentiment, you know, in the best sense of the word sentiment. It's not sentimental, but it is the literature of sentiment. And indeed, so is Hong Lam Mang, you know. And I think that um, only in Hong Kong could that spirit survive, because in the mainland it was crushed from the very, very beginning. I mean, why, after all, what was the very first literary campaign in China? It was directed directly at Hong Lam Mang, you know, because Hong Lam Mang was one of those targets that was absolutely ready made for the destruction of the human spirit. And I have to say, it's it, nothing. Nothing's changed since. Sorry, that's enough for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'll just have a few words about method. Um, my incredibly time-consuming translation method is to put down a first draft that makes almost no sense in the target language. Uh, it is so closely literal and faithful to the original um, and so I, I, I try to do this as quickly as I can although if there are tricky linguistic uh, questions then obviously that 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 slows me down but as I say it, it's 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 very messy it's very unidiomatic um, but I've kept this method over the years um, because I find it quite it quite helpful to keep me close to the rhythms and the particularities and the the, the, the differences and the strangenesses um, of the original um, when I come back to do my endless revisions um, after I've put down the entire uh, a translation of the entire thing. Um, so if that's a novel, it'd be the translation of the entire novel in this sort of very clunky English prose. Or if it's a collection of short stories, I'll have done all the short stories before I come back to revise them. Uh, and so on the one hand, it keeps me, when I come to revise, it kind of reminds me of the rhythms of the original, you know, what I want to keep, what I think is not going to work in the target language. Um, but it also kind of buys me time while I am constantly sort of assessing the original, you know, having gone through the whole thing, uh, having a sort of better bird's eye view of what I think are the really most important, you know, salient aspects of the original that I don't want to lose in my target translation. And some of those salient, salient aspects might be you know something a little bit vaguer sounding than idiomatic translation they might be tonal um you know they're, they're they might be sort of particular aspects of of, of a voice or a sort of humor uh, the sorts of things which are very very difficult to translate faithfully um and you know sometimes you have to find tonal equivalents or close to tonal equivalents that might not be sort of slavishly literal translations for them. Um, so that, that's a kind of couple of reasons why that is my process. Um, but I, I think for you know, any translator, and at some point I would you know, love to hear about um, uh, John's own um, sort of literary education and his, his, his own kind of diet of reading. I think it's incredibly important for a translator to read voraciously, not only in the language of the original that they're translating from, but also in the target language. I mean, that was a piece of advice I got very early on, passed on to me indirectly uh, from David Roy, you know, the great um, translator of um, uh, The Plum in the Garden, the, 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 the Plum in the Golden Vase. I think that was passed on to me from by my wonderful supervisor who, who'd studied under him in, in, in Chicago. And that, yeah, that piece of advice was to any translator has to read as much as they can in the target language so that they have all sorts of possibilities that they can draw on for sort of tone and expression. I think it's something uh, that you and I have spoken about many years ago, Brendan. Um, but for this particular 
translation um, because there are very strong comic elements in it I sort of found myself uh, thinking again about traditions of comic writing in English also because there is something so intensely childlike often about Monkey you know he really doesn't think things through he's sort of surprised by disastrous outcomes when he's done really really awful things so I actually started to you know revisit some of the sort of favourite um, comic children's books, actually, that I'd read to my children. And obviously none of these things, I'm not going to import any of these styles or tones wholesale, but you have to be like a magpie. And then you obviously you have to make your own decision about what combinations will work, you know, whether there's there is sometimes there, the, the contrasts are too great and it's going to strain things. Um, so it's a sort of constant process of of, uh, of, of, of making judgments. Um, but yeah, that, that's a, a, a very brief incoherent introduction to my own process. Far from incoherent. Uh, we've got a, a lot of questions um, coming up and I want to start with um, two in the queue, one for each of you. Um, so one is from um, Andrea uh, Linkenfelter, and I'll just mention um, that she has a connection to LA Review of Books. She did a piece for the LA Review of Books blog, Blarb, introducing Tammy Ho's poetry, um, an important Hong Kong uh, poet. Um, but her question is, um, to John Minford, was the six book project you're involved with um, parallel to another project funded by the same organization, the Hong Kong Atlas Project uh, involving Muse Press that did uh, 10 books? And she just says a disclaimer, she translated um, Hon Lai Chu for Muse and Hong Kong um, Atlas. So with that, was that connected? And the question for Julia um, from Jonathan Chatwin is uh, thinking about the language and the US cover of your translation, and you partially answered this, I think, it seems you approach the text with a desire to make it accessible to young readers. I can imagine reading it with young children. Is my inference correct? And if so, how difficult was it to render the text in this vibrant and uh, colloquial mode? And it does, of course, come with a, a foreword by uh, graphic novelist, uh, Jean Luen Yang. So, that also suggests maybe you had young readers in mind. Uh, but John, was there a connection between the Hong Kong Atlas project and your Hong Kong literature series? Well, I'm terribly sorry that there wasn't there. I mean, there were several projects going on at the same time, some of them funded by the Arts Council and some of them connected with that wonderful but short-lived journal called Muse. And um, there was no direct link between mine and that one there. I, 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 I just have to say no. I, I, I don't, I'm not even aware of it, to be honest, because a lot of the work I was doing on this project was after I left Hong Kong, and therefore I'm afraid I, 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 I'm aware of Andrea's work as well in translating other, other, other works of Hong Kong literature, but I don't know about this Atlas project, so no. Well, it's just one thing that's very interesting is with your project that there's this, this surge of interest, which I think is poignant and understandable, as a world in Hong Kong is disappearing, of preserving it. And there's also been, interestingly, a boom in Hong Kong scholarly studies too, at precisely the moment when the distinctiveness is, is endangered. And so I think that's, that's a, it's the fact that there are multiple projects is, um, yes. is a very interesting thing there. I'd like to know more about this project actually. Sure, yeah. great. Uh, Julia, about where you, th did you have, did you have your youngest child in mind? Was it something that it might be uh, a book for for him, or what were you were you thinking? Yes. Well, it, it's true. I mean, my children who are aged seventeen, fifteen, and eight. But when the older two were young, we spent some a, a few months together in China when we were when when they were very little, and we did buy a Wai Wenju, a sort of foreign languages press bilingual version of Dan Ao Tian Gong, so sort of great upheaval in heaven. So the, the the prologue in which Monkey makes terrible trouble in heaven, um, and although you know the translation in that version was quite clunky, it was very interesting 
to me how they tumbled into the story and you know fell in love with the monkey king and in fact i was doing a q a on dan out the um the classic 1961 65 um animation done in the prc i was doing a q a for it last week so i re-watched it with my youngest uh who's eight um and although you know me as a sort of cultural historian it's very interesting um because i i can see how the prc cultural establishment change the story you know they change the ending of it and that strikes me as terribly interesting um but my eight-year-old son knew nothing about that and he was instantly entranced by it you know it seems that all eight-year-olds um wherever they are in the world are going to love naughty monkeys you know that's just that's just a universal um and so i was very um i was very, I was very struck by how uh, immediately the story and the character uh of sun wukong spoke to him um i but in in terms of the the choices that i made about the translation i think sort of bringing out the that the speed and the humor of the narrative is not distorting the original because you know there is a lot of humor in there um uh, there's a lot of uh mischief there's a lot of repartee for example between monkey and the pig demon uh pigsy so i don't think that's a distortion of the original um but i would also say that i think there are other elements in the novel which are I've, I've, I've kept in my translation um, and that, that, that it's important not to overlook and, and once you sort of think about them they, they, they come out and one really important element is the religious spiritual element you know 20th century readings of um, Xi or Ji from you know, people like Hu Shi onwards, you know, these secularizing intellectuals really try to downplay the religion in the novel. They try to sort of say, oh, it's just a bit of, of, of mischievous fictional fun. Um, but you know, you don't have to look very hard to see religion absolutely everywhere in the novel. You know, the sort of the mastery of Taoist practices is what gives monkey his superpowers, um, you know, the, the, the presentation of the, the Jade Emperor, the Taoist heaven and hell, you know, these are sort of profoundly uh, Taoist elements. Um, there's a lot of um, thinking about the other three, the other, the other three teachings of uh, Imperial China. Uh, there's a lot of what you might call kind of Confucian beliefs, you know, the monsters are all full of filial piety, you know, they keep on failing to eat monkey and his disciples because they're very anxious to invite their beloved parents over to enjoy the feast. And of course, the pilgrimage itself um, is a Buddhist pilgrimage um, all the way to India to sort of pick up these sutras, which will um, enlighten uh, uh, China. Uh, and there's definitely a kind of redemptive moral arc um, to uh, Monkey's journey from this hellraiser to a virtuous Buddhist at the end. So I think I would emphasize above all that it is an open text, that it sort of lends itself to this um, sort of humor and mischief. Uh, but there are, there's, it also tells you a really enormous amount about um, Chinese society and culture, um, and most importantly, attitudes to spirituality and religion. So there's, there's one question that I can't resist reading after that uh, question about youth, because this comes from a fourth grader uh, who describes um, themselves as a Monkey King fan. And it just has a very specific question. Uh, says, I'm reading your translation of Monkey King currently, Dr. Julia Lovell, and I really enjoy it. I noticed in the beginning in uh, Ao Guang's palace, he mentioned you the great. Does this actually mean that Monkey King's period is after you the great's time period? <laughs> Thank you for keeping me historically grounded. I, I would also say that possibly the most painful aspect, that those of you who have a physical copy of the translation will see that there is a map 
there, uh, which was absolutely beautifully executed on a uh, model uh, that I and a wonderful scholar, a Xi or Ji called um, Hao Ji, uh, put together for this absolutely genius map maker. And in the top left hand corner, uh, she has this sort of wonderful, wonderfully um, uh, wry comment, uh, these lands are somewhat mythical. Um, so so I, I struggled a lot with mythological geography in the making of that. But, but thinking about mythological history instead. So if you do the maths, basically, so um, Monkey is broken out of his prison in sort of roughly you know, 620s um, CE, um, which means that, so he's been under that mountain for 500 years. Um, so that brings, puts him, his, his kind of sort of Tr the, 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 the big bust up with heaven, that's like sort of first, second century um, uh, AD, CE. Um, and then you think that he's been um, uh, uh, sort of three or 400 years um, before that, that's where he, um, that, that, that's when he's picking up his uh, immortal tricks. Um, so, so sort of you the great is, is, is sort of uh, right back in the sort of mythological mist. Um, so sort of way before um, uh, 20,000 BC, I think. Um, so yes, Monkey is post you the Great, uh, and that works out well for him, of course, because you the Great has tamed the floods and very helpfully left his um, iron marker at the bottom of the ocean, uh, which Monkey can then claim and uh, put to all sorts of demonic usages. So thank you so much for that question and that historical clarification. Great. Now, the the way the questions are supposed to work are to come in through the Q and A. But we have one translator in the audience who has put up his hand and asked to be able to re respond to to weigh in. Brian Holton, who translates Yang Lian's poetry. Um, so I'm going to see if I can allow him to talk. I'm not sure if it will work, but here, Brian, I'm going to try to make it so you can. Are you able to, Brian? I, I think it may not uh, be, let me see. No, uh -huh. I, I don't think it, I don't think it works with this. We have it as we had the way we have this set up. So I'm going to go on to um, more questions. And this was one for, um, Sorry about that. I will, this is one for both panelists, but I think it could actually be for all four of you. Um, it's from um, Jeremiah Christie. Uh, I'm wondering if there were any particular aha moments in your research or translation work where a piece of writing illuminated an aspect of Chinese culture that had seemed difficult or confusing, either current or ancient. And I do think this is always the best question in a sense to ask of, um, of academic work as well as translation, what surprised you? What was, was there an epiphany? <laughs> it's also a hard question. Yes, very hard question. I mean, of course, I mean, I hope there'll be an epiphany every day, you know, one has to, I think every translator has to live in hope, you know, but um, I, I, I think one has to be very careful when talking about epiphanies. Um, of course, the translator has to act on the assumption that um, we're, all, we're all universal spirits and, and whatever, you know, job by you is thinking and feeling is something that we can think and feel. But um, frankly, I find that um, epiphany, it, epiphanies are um, somewhat, somewhat of a delusion, you know, and I, as I guess I become more and more ancient, um, I suppose I'm a little bit more cagey about calling something an epiphany. I have some wonderful moments, that's for sure, but um, I wouldn't call them an epiphany. So I dare say my colleagues might think differently. Uh, Brendan and Hu Ying, why don't you pitch in here? <laughs> yeah, come on. Um, for me, I, I don't know if I'd call it an epiphany, but uh, reading either, you know, say, Liao Jai or, or late Ming Dynasty fiction uh, or Zhuangzi or, you know, reading original texts, uh, 
either as a translator or as a student, um, I'm just constantly reminded that, oh, right, these were real people. Oh, right, you know, Tronza is extremely funny. Oh, right, poop jokes were funny in the 17th century too. And um, it, it's, it's not much of an epiphany, but it is a reminder of exactly that, that kind of common human spirit, which is something that often I, I think gets covered over in uh, the, the, I would say the overly reverent attitude uh, that many moderns have to works like Journey to the West or um, the other classics. I, I think is I think I would say more. I couldn't agree with you more, Brendan. I think I think you just have this feeling. It's a very good feeling, you know, when you discover that you've got common ground with Joanza. What could be better than that, you know? And the trouble with translation theory is that it's an absolute killer, you know. I, I love the remark by Philip Pullman. He said in one of his essays, um, uh, uh, the theorists came, came on board and said this, this, and this, 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 and this. And Philip Pullman, who's one of my great heroes, great storyteller, Philip Pullman said, go away now and come back when you've got something useful to say. And I feel that, I feel that what you're describing, which is so true and so good, is 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 the real thing, you know, and I, I I I'm afraid I have a very bad reputation for throwing away anything to do with translation theory because it it just doesn't seem it seems to me that all the translators are so busy translating they really don't have time for translation theory, and whereas the whereas the theorists they're like insects you know, they're like parasites they want to suck your blood you know and no doubt they would discover all kinds of moments of epiphany you know. But I mean, I think what you're describing is much more real. It's such a wonderful feeling, a fellow feeling, to discover that Pu Sung Ling, you know, is who he is, despite all those barriers, despite the barriers of history, of language, and so on and so forth. He's a real guy, you know, and he speaks to you, and he's a good person. To, he's a good person to have a glass of wine with, you know. That's that's the ultimate compliment, you know. And of course, and that tradition goes all the way back to Zhuangzi. I'm so glad you brought in Zhuangzi. Zhuangzi, the great, the greatest storyteller of all time. And you know, to be able to tune into that is a, is a great, an incredible privilege. Mm. I'd just like to add one other thing about the um, incredibly fruitful and enjoyable trails that translation set you off on and I speak from someone in academia and as anyone in academia knows that, that that translation is in general frowned upon you know it's not what we're meant to be spending our time on we're meant to be spending our time on our own uh monographs that's seen as far more um worthwhile uh, but I see translation as a very very intense engagement with a primary source uh, that can tell you uh, so many things about imagination and, and, and sometimes you can infer things about context as well. So for me, one of the uh, wonderful outcomes of working on this book is that up to this point, uh, one of the wonderful outcomes of working on uh, Monkey King Journey to the West is that up to that point, my interests had been really overwhelmingly modern and overwhelmingly secular. Um, and in order to um, uh, attempt this translation, it really required me to take uh, a deep dive into, for example, the philosophical and institutional histories of Taoism. So it sort of took me along all sorts of trails um, which have, um, I, I obviously I can't claim to have a perfect understanding of these things that I set off to study, but they enormously enriched my understanding of um, both pre-imperial and imperial China. Hmm. To chime in on that, um, yeah, I, I, I know very well the attitude you're talking about that uh, translation is, is not serious or not scholarship. Um, and you'd mentioned David Roy, whose rendition of uh, Tin Ping Mei, the, the Plum and the Golden Vase, is, uh, I'd say the Plum and the Golden Vase and the Story of the Stone are tipping my hand here, the, the two greatest novels of the pre-20th century tradition. Um, 
uh, John, your approach to that uh, with David Hawkes is really the opposite of David Roy's approach in that his translation is approximately 90% footnote by, by weight. Um, but they're both these just distillations of a, a lifetime of scholarship. Um, and, you know, a, a Taiwanese uh, historian of, of, uh, of Ming Dynasty urban history once mentioned to me that, you know, she read Jinping Mei in David Roy's translation because it's far more accessible to her than the, the Chinese original. And all of the engagement and all of those potential little pathways are right there on the surface. And, and it's just a remarkable work of scholarship as well as of translation. Mm. So we could go on a very long time, but I want to try to bring this to a conclusion in the time uh, that we set aside for it. And so there are two questions finally that I think um, that kind of come together in a, in a certain way that maybe will will spur final remarks and they're partly looking forward. Uh, so one, Yvonne Wong uh, from Toronto wrote, I have some curiosity about our speaker's experience with the shifting market for translated fiction, Chinese fiction, and whether new media and the intense popularity of Japanese and Korean cultural products, say anime, have had any impact on said market. Are world literature courses starting to incorporate more Sinophone literature? And also um, my own colleague here from uh, the School of the Arts, Daphne Lei, who, um, who engages with Chinese um, culture and cross-cultural exchange and translation, and we've, we've, we've done panels related to this, um, does it through the works of, of, of drama. And this came up with John mentioning um, the impact of Hong Kong film, which didn't lead automatically to an interest in Hong Kong literature as it might have. And she just brings up that the connection that thinking about Monkey King, popular appeal and transformations is just a reminder that the literal translation is only one of the 72 transformations of Sun Wukong. And we can also think of the coexistence of these literary texts with the performed versions with, um, you know, with comic books, with um, television shows. And I know, Julia, you were led in part to Monkey King through a television show. Um, and I think it's a, really, it's a really interesting, deep question that we are much more aware, uh, people growing up in the United States now, at least, are much more aware of some elements of, um, of popular culture and characters and other things from um, East Asia. But that won't necessarily mean uh, more reading of the works in translation. So I just wonder if there are any thoughts about maybe just how things have changed in your careers as, as translators of how is it getting easier to try to convince um, a reader or a publisher that here's this, this work in, in Chinese fiction that I want to bring to um, a wider audience. Is it getting easier? Well, John, I mean, do you I, want to start because you've got the longer range view? Thanks a lot, Julia. <laughs> I, I, I mean that in a, in a respectful way. I know you do, I know you do. That's very kind of you. No, I mean, frankly, Jeff, I think it's getting hard or not easier. Um, I mean, one, let me give you an example. Some 20, 30 years ago, I became involved with the great Hong Kong martial arts novelist, Jin Yong, you know, Lewis Cha. And, um, he wanted me to translate his entire work, which is like 36 volumes. I had the good sense only to do one work, but that came out in three volumes called The Deer in the Cauldron. And it was recently released, re-released as a paperback in a three, three volume set. But I mean, this is one of the most widely read novelists in the world. He sells like hundreds of millions of copies of his books. And um, this is the, it simply has not got across to the English reader. And I tried my very hardest, you know, I tried to make it a romp. I tried, I just threw caution to the winds and, and um, you know, had a huge amount of fun, so much fun that the author was a bit cheesed off actually. But I mean, the point is it should have been an absolute bestseller, but it never was and it never will be. And, you know, um, what can I say? I mean, the story of the stone sells a paltry number of copies every year. And this is, this is one of the great works of world literature. 
without any question whatsoever. And um, I think we're up against, you know, it's, it's like we're up against an element here in the world which is similar to the Trump, you know, the, the extreme right, QAnon, whatever you call them. People simply, we've got, we've got a lot of work to do and it may, it may take another 500 years because people are very, very resistant to anything new, anything strange. And um, translators are sometimes up against it. We're really up against it. However hard we try, how, however good a job we try and do, it just falls, it just disappears into an empty pit, you know. So I'm, I'm afraid my immediate answer to you, Jeff, is that it's a really bad situation. Things are not getting better. And I don't quite know what to do about it, frankly. It's, it's, it is a serious problem. I think it's wonderful that people like Julia are producing new translations of Lucian and John Eileen, you know. Um, but where do we actually, you see, I think people read a lot more Japanese literature in translation than they do Chinese. And I've never quite understood why. Um, but I mean, uh, it, it's a very serious problem and it won't get solved, you know, tomorrow. Unfortunately. I, I want to... I, I want to hear from the rest of you on this question, but I did just get the question, the comment from Brian Holton, which I just want to weave oh, yeah. in since I wasn't Brian, able to allow. Yes. What did Brian have to say? Well, he just said, perhaps you might ask our principals, since I can't, how often they have invented a register, a language, an idiolect, and isn't it fun? <laughs> <laughs> well, good old Brian, because he translates into the strangest dialects, you know, and he's a, he's a very, very talented translator. I don't think I'm in the same position as him because I'm a good straightforward English speaker. I don't speak, you know, some obscure border dialect, you know. But um, but you do have to invent kind of idiolects, yes. And it's and and of course it's fun, you know, especially if you can get away with it without being shot, you know. I think it's always fun to create strange ways of speaking. I felt like that when I made Jabayu speak speak Latin, you know. I was expecting to be hung, drawn, and quartered, but actually nobody dared take me to the cleaners. That was fun. I mean, I, I and um, so I think I can understand Brian's point, but I, I, I'm not as gifted as he is when it comes to this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, my 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 chapeau is very bad to Brian. To, to Brian, very my hat is taken off um, because he, he translates Yang Lien, who is, is very, very difficult uh, poet mm. to, um, uh, to, 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 to understand, very, very complex writer. Um, so I, I think probably my own contribution in this field would be no more than, than, than collages, than putting different registers and tones together, like, like, a, like a magpie and to see see whether it'll work together um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and if not to try something else. But I, yeah, I see myself more as, as, as collecting things and, and putting them together rather than creating something from scratch. I just like to um, uh, really express my admiration to Daphne for Daphne's uh, turn of phrase. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was sort of very struck by how Journey to the West Monkey King is a book about shape-shifting which has itself shape-shifted that seemed like a sort of wonderful uh, a, a wonderful fit there um then it's really interesting to hear john's perspective on the kind of current economy and politics of um chinese literary translation in english um my own experience is so i started translating what in round about 2000 i think that's when i took on my first project and it, it really was a, a massive struggle to get um, publishers interested and you know people I thought of the very highly you know very educated um, fellow students I was doing a PhD at the time but who were working in um, say English lit you know they they would say things to me like oh d does China have a literature you know the the, the 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 marginal status of Chinese literature in the sort of general anglophone consciousness at that point I think it's sort of quite hard to overestimate. Um, I think that publishers and agents are more open to approaches um, from Chinese literature now, but it is still very hard to manage 
big successes. Um, I think this is for a few reasons. There's, first of all, there's the kind of famous Anglophone world's aversion to translation. So a very small proportion of the books published every year are in translation uh, compared to literary cultures such as that of the Netherlands or sort of even sort of France or Germany. Um, uh, and so if such a small proportion in this, definitely in the low single figures um, is in books in translation, obviously the books in Chinese are going to be an even tinier proportion of that tiny proportion. Um, and I sort of see a couple of developments, you know, since I've been working on literary translation, uh, I think that the interest in China has grown a great deal in terms of the, uh, the, the space that it commands as a news story in headlines. So, you know, people are coming to terms with the fact that, you know, they, that, that, that China is a rising superpower um, and that, you know, the economies of the West and that of China are completely um, enmeshed. And, you know, big stories like um, sort of Huawei and TikTok, um, and uh, you know, a lot of very alarming stories are sort of very close to general consciousness at the moment, even to the point that people are talking about us being in the foothills of a new Cold War with China the adversary uh, rather than uh, Russia now. But I would question the extent to which that has um, led to a serious um, engagement outside specialist circles with the, the the Chinese sort of Chinese culture or the Chinese imagination broadly understood, which is so well served and expressed by literature. You know, sort of literature is is when, when all said and done, a work of a work of literature um, uh, showcases one individual imagination. You know, one individual's um, experience and perception of whatever reality. Um, and so I I feel that um, the, the the general anglophone reader um, has not um, come to terms with the idea that you know Chinese culture is something we really need to engage seriously and deeply with and coming back to a point that um, I, I think that we made earlier on I still feel there's a very serious cultural deficit between uh, China and the West I think that you know the average educated uh, Chinese reader will know a lot more about Anglophone culture and Anglophone literature than we can say in reverse. And I think that's a problem. Any final thoughts, Hu Ying or Brendan? Um, maybe just a quick rejoinder. Um, my own field is Lei Qing, so during that time, um, you know, the Chinese first encountered the West and in the literati circles, uh, they were exactly the same talk and say, okay, so maybe uh, their gambos were pretty good. Uh, maybe even their government, uh, there's something we can uh, study, but surely they do not have literature. Um, <laughs> that's what we have. Uh, they don't have literature. So then, you know, um, very soon after that, um, we get to the world where a lot of Chinese people read uh, Western literature. So, so um, maybe in um, shorter than 500 years, uh, we will see the reverse. Can, can I make one, one comment about that? One of the first kinds of Western literature, as you know, that was interested in translation, that was translated into Chinese was science fiction, in part because this was seen as a twofer. You learned about Western technologies, which they might have advanced things, and you learned about Western societies. So there's an irony now, the one genre of Chinese literature that has done well recently in translation has been Chinese science fiction, perhaps because there's a perception that China at this moment of becoming somewhat, perhaps where the future lies, that we can, gain something from reading. So that's just a, a kind of uh, speculation there, uh, possibility. I, I, I love that speculative insight. <laughs> Brendan, do you have a final thought here? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have seen people writing about, uh, you know, reading Liu Cixin to understand the Chinese mind, uh, capital T, capital C, capital M. And um, 
it, it does seem to, to echo a bit of that. Um, yeah, there are economic difficulties. It is hard to get publishers interested. Uh, I think another one of the big difficulties is just that uh, as compared to say Japanese literature, Japanese media, which are uh, immediately appealing, which have a built-in fan base, um, a lot of the things that get promoted for translation overseas through uh, say the, the Zoltschutu programs um, are not that good or not that enjoyable or not that interesting. Um, there's, I, I think, more generally been a lot of attention paid to being impressive rather than to being likable. Um, and so, you know, seeing uh, things like Journey to the West coming out in new translation is really encouraging because it is such an, an intensely likable book and, and hopefully that will drive further interest in, in Chinese literature not as you know a, a fetish object, not as something to be admired, but as something to be engaged with as an equal and enjoyed. I think that's a wonderful note to end in and on. And I think it's great that there's at least interest in tuning in to hear about Chinese translation. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, all of you for um, for taking part in this, uh, both on the stage and in the audience. So thank you so much.